Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Alex. Welcome back to another episode of the Stop Being Busy podcast. So this is week three. Yeah, getting on this consistency thing. <laughs> it's definitely been one of my challenges in the past, starting something and then giving up right when you start. So I'm trying to be a bit better this time. I'm trying to be a bit better. I'll keep the consistency because I know this is going to be a slow burner to obviously get people listening and just understanding what, where I'm coming from, what I'm talking about. But um, if you haven't listened to the first two episodes, I hope you enjoyed them. I really enjoyed recording them, just getting them out there and learning more about this podcast process. So even like recording it and editing it, they're just new skills, new things to me. I've done little bits in the past. But in a way, like I did last week, if you've got any questions, if there's anything you want me to cover, then yeah, go to my TikTok. It's at stop being busy or one word drop me a dm on any of my videos just leave a message yeah first week we were looking at just a general introduction on what stop being busy is last week i was talking about some objections to contracting but yeah i'm going to switch up the topic a little bit this week and yeah my son is 21 months old i don't know where the time has gone it's literally just flown by but i just want to reflect on those 21 months of being a dad so it's where just saying I'm a dad is strange in itself. So I always wanted to be a dad. I just didn't know when it would happen or how it would happen or at the when I was younger, who it'd be with, of course. These are all the unknowns. So our little boy Lucas, 21 months old. I'm just gonna go through some of the things. So like I'm gonna go right back to the beginning. Um, my thoughts and my feelings when he was born, some of like his key milestones, where we're at now. Just some of the things that I've experienced along the way. I'm definitely going to miss out stuff. <laughs> I've written down as much notes as I can just to remember so I can talk about it um, on this podcast. But I'm definitely going to miss out stuff. But what I'm going to do in the future is I'm going to try and get Anna onto the podcast. So she, we can go through some some other part. Maybe even from her point of view, that might be quite good as well. Because obviously, yes, we agree on um, bringing up the little one. But obviously, we, do, we still do things in different ways. Um, that's the beauty of having... A relationship or partner you are slightly different we agree on a lot but we do have um, slightly different approaches to some things with parenting um and i think it's nice good balance for luca anyway yeah going back to the beginning even getting to the hospital was a crazy one so my wife started her contractions really early in the morning she just thought it was maybe just a little bit of a pain and i was like no that's definitely your contractions this must have been about 6 a.m now she was timing them we were timing them and they were very they weren't regular at all they just had their own their own spacing throughout the throughout the morning. Um, some were weaker than others, some were stronger than others, um, as they are. Um, and I remember that particular day, we were watching a lot of football. So um, on BT Sport, there was like the morning 12 o'clock kickoff. Um, and then we were listening to the three o'clock on the radio. And then we watched the five o'clock or 5.30 kickoff. And then there was like a friend, the PSG kicked off in the evening. It must have been like seven or eight o'clock. And uh, <laughs> this is when I was like, no, 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 no. We got to go and do something now. We need, like, this has been going on long enough. Let's, like, go into the hospital and see if we can get a little checkup. So we called in England. There's 112 or 111. It's, like, not emergency services, but it's, like, emergency assistance. So you can call in, ask some questions. So we had some questions about it. And the midwife or the person who answered the phone is like, you're, you're absolutely fine. There's nothing. No need to go in. Just chill. Just relax. Wait for your contractions to come properly. And me being me, I was like, nope, let's pack up the car. Let's go to the hospital and see what's going on. <laughs> so that's exactly what we did. And while we were packing, that's when Anna's proper contraction started. So I was like, yeah, this is this is go time. Obviously, it might not be go time. You could be in labor for a very long time from when that happens. But I was like, yeah, this is a good idea to get in there, get in the hospital now. Even parking. So the hospital where Luca was born, there's no parking at all. They got rid of the car park. So finding a parking space is, it's a myth. It's just not, it's, they're just not there. She actually went into the, um, into labor on a Saturday evening where residential parking in the area is free. Going into Sunday where you don't have to pay for parking as well. So that was a good blessing. And when we got there, we actually managed to find a, a parking space right next to the entrance of the hospital. So things were on our side, things were on our side. So we went in, we went to our NCT classes and they they told us about where you got to go, what wing you need to go to, how you check in. So that was all on my like to-do list. Um, so I didn't have to think about all of that. That was for me to deal with and I dealt with that. 
So we got there, got to the win, checked in. Anna at this point, um, she's really good at just blocking out pain, much better than me. If I get a little cold or anything, I'm complaining, I'm moaning. But um, I don't know how she's able to just handle and deal with pain to another level. So um, we'll put in this waiting room. Um, hospital's really busy. It was really hot. It was so warm in this hospital. We got there, so no AC, just sweating, sweating. Just waiting for someone to come in and check her. No one came. So I went in the hall and I'd like flagged down one of the midwives, nurses. And I was like, look, and then we get some gas in there or something because my wife's in pain and I think it might help. And they were like, no, 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 it's all right. She's not that far gone yet. She's not that far gone yet. So time carried on, time carried on. We were there for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then the nurse needed to come in to do the checks. And when she did check, they saw that Anna was dilated. Like, I think it was 10 centimetres, which is ridiculous. So this is just her sitting on the bed, dilated 10 centimetres. So we got moved from there into the actual labour ward. <laughs> so where we went for making a phone call where, no, the baby's not coming yet. Just relax and chill. Within two hours to, yep, you need to go into the labour ward and we are ready to give birth. Yeah, that's where we went. Went over there. Yeah, playing the nice music. So we had a bit of a plan. So we had the music playing, the midwife are in there. But baby just didn't want to come. Like Anna didn't feel like pushing and like they were trying to get her to push, but she didn't feel like pushing. And obviously if you know your body, you know your body, you can't be forced to do something. If you if it doesn't feel right, I doesn't want to do that. <laughs> it was really funny as well. So one of the midwives was like, do I want to go next to my wife and hold her hand? And I'm like, nah, <laughs> nah, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And the midwife looked at me and was like, that's your wife, your husband, sort it out. But um, this is a big bit of advice to anyone that's going into, if you're going into the labour um, situation, like obviously you know your partner more than anyone else. So don't feel pressured um, to do something just because someone's saying you have to do it. Do you know what I mean? You know your partner the best. So and I actually appreciated that I didn't get too close. I wasn't in her space and I was just allowing her to do her thing. She knew, she felt my presence there and we have spoken about this before Then that's all that she really needed. Luca didn't want to come. So we did in the end have to have a little bit of help. He was delivered with forceps. Left some little marks on his face, not too bad. Um, honestly, they cleared up within a couple of weeks. But yeah, I've skipped out a lot, but there's only so much detail really I can go in um, into it. Um, that was only, it was a couple of hours. It wasn't that long once we got to the hospital. It must have been around half nine, 10 o'clock. And Luca was here at like one, two o'clock latest. Um, so it was a fairly quick labor under 24 hours for the first child. That's really good. And then, yeah, when he was born, so in the op operating ward, um, when he was born, baby was handed to me. So it was wrapped in a towel, handed to me. And honestly, I was so nervous. I'm just holding him and I had to walk across the room. The room was massive as well. Well, it felt really big. Like the, op the operating room was really, really big. I um, had to walk over to the weighing table so I could weigh him. And <laughs> in the NCT class, like you learn, obviously you're holding the little dummy babies and you do all change of nappies and everything. But when you're holding your own child and you've got to do that walk, I just felt like my arms are like jelly, legs are like jelly. And I was like, just whatever you do, don't fall over, don't stack, don't drop the baby. <laughs> it's literally what was going through my head. I know it sounds quite morbid, but it's literally what was going through my head at the time. So he got him to the weighing table and then it was just going through the processes. So they did all the checks on him. He went to mum. Mum gave him a big cuddle and everything. And it hadn't hit us yet that we had become parents. Like it was still very early on in the process, a bit in shock as well. It's, unre it's such an unreal experience from going from just being the two of you to having another being who completely just relies on you and you want for everything. Yeah, I can't, I can't explain it. It's a, it's a beautiful feeling, but it's just one that's so strange and so alien um, when it first happens. And it takes time, I guess, to get used to it. We're still getting used to it now and he's nearly two. I can just remember the emotion of Rai's hair. He has all fingers, all toes. He's breathing healthy. It's like, there's so many things that are rushing through your brain. It's like, is he okay? Is he healthy? Is mum okay? Is she healthy? Do you know what I mean? There's so many things going through, but... Um, hats off to the medical team and staff. Like they were really good at making sure that he was delivered safely. And to do that at one, two o'clock in the morning and be on job um, and then still be able to smile about it after, like hats off. It's a, it's a very difficult job. I don't know how they do it. And say so still locked in um, at all times because that wasn't, that definitely wasn't the only baby that they helped deliver that morning or that day. 
in in fact. So yeah, the first proper night that I stayed in the hospital, um, this would have been the Sunday night now. Luca just didn't want to sleep. He didn't want to sleep at all. So it was really like working out working out what what can we do to help him sleep. So Anna was knackered, so I let her rest. And that was when I was basically just walking around with Luca. So I wrapped him in a blanket, um, spoke to him, like made some like hushing noises, rocking him. And in that time, even though it was a few hours, I learned a few techniques that really helped for the next couple of months. So I think maybe I imprinted um, some calming techniques on him that he responded to, or there were just things that worked. I don't know. Because it's, it's quite stressful um, for the child when they're being born. Um, and the reason why he did have to be born um, with a bit of assistance is because he was getting tired. The baby gets tired during uh, labour as well. So if you don't get the baby out in time, then they can go into a bit of distress and it all gets a bit techie <laughs> from there as well. But yeah, he was a bit he was a bit tired and distressed. Yeah, moving on, I'm going to jump a little bit onto our next big milestone. So this was sleep um, and this was a big one. So I'm I'm a good sleeper in the sense of give me a bed or give me anywhere and within 10 seconds unless I'm thinking about work which doesn't happen very often when I go to bed give me 10 seconds and I'll fall asleep doesn't matter where I am doesn't even matter if I'm tired or not I can definitely fall asleep so getting to sleep wasn't too bad for me so if I needed to get up look after Luca absolutely fine give him some milk go back to bed I can do that Um, but for Anna it's a bit different once she's up she's up she finds it really difficult to get back to sleep so um, what we found is when little man was in our room, we had this bassinet that connected to, that connected to our actual bed itself. Um, so he was sleeping there and Anna could see him. If she needed to feed, she would just sit up, pull him over. She could feed him and he could go back to sleep. And that worked um, for the first couple of months, month or two, maybe. And it was, it was necessary, obviously, because he's feeding. I can't even remember how many times he was feeding, but it like, felt like all the time. But when he was in that bed, as he got a little bit older, he could smell mum all the time so he wanted to feed all the time even when he should be sleeping he wanted to feed and then it was becoming constant drain on Anna and having him there so what we did is we kind of wrote up a rotor in how we would navigate the night times so we put a crib or a bassinet I should say in the living room um, and then I would basically take Luke from say I'm not sure I can't remember the exact times but say it was like eight o'clock I'll take him from eight o'clock and then I'd have him to two or three in the morning and then I'd hand over to hour. I'll get a couple hours sleep and then I'll be, go back to work in the morning. And that was all fine. But still, what we were finding is because Anna was waking up and breaking her sleep and she, again, not very good at getting back to sleep when she was up. She was getting really, really bad sleep um, anyway. So what I decided to do is because I'm a bit of a night owl and again, I can just get up and, and sleep whenever is I just took Luca into the living room full time and I just did the nights. So as soon as eight o'clock came, um, I sent Anna to bed. I was like, get your head down. I'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and then it'll be my time um, with the little man. So it wasn't too bad. Anna would express. So he was still on breast milk. He actually took um, to a bottle. He didn't He didn't reject the bottle, which is a lot of people, again, a lot of babies, babies do. So it, was, it helped that I was able to do that. And again, I'm just building that bond, spend some time with him. But also during this time, we also introduced formula as well, formula milk as well, which has its added benefits because babies actually sleep a lot better when they're on formula milk. As he outgrew his bassinet, so he started rolling. Um, I can't remember when this was, maybe around four months, five months, he started rolling from his back onto his belly. Um, the bassinet was a bit too small for him. Um, he would get stuck in the corners and it's obviously a suffocation risk. So moved him into his own bed. And this was around again, five or six months. I can't remember exactly when, but he loved it. He loved being in his own room. Um, we always used white noise from the beginning. At first I was just using playlists that I found on Spotify or videos on you, mainly playlists on Spotify because the videos on YouTube had the ads and that would wake him up, it broke the noise. Um, and I was using that, had them on repeat, but then I just went down, I just went and bought an actual white noise machine, which was a consistent sound. Um, you can turn it on and off when you wanted, um, had a light on it. It just made life a lot easier having that and it had that consistent sound. And to this day, you still use it, uses it. So we're able to, once he goes to bed, put music on, we can talk. If people come around, we can talk, it doesn't matter. It won't wake him up. If it, obviously, if we're right next to his room talking or shouting, then he'll wake up. But if we're in the living room, 
and he's got the white noise on, then yeah, we could just carry on um, with our evening. So yeah, that was then. Big thing, if you're able to do it um, and you don't mind doing the nights, 100% help the missus out, do the nights. Because the mums, they need a lot of a lot of time to recover and, re- and recharge, especially if they're breastfeeding. It's tiring. They need to, it takes up a lot of energy. And yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know how they do it. Like super mum. All the super mums out there, I've got to get, take my hats off and round of applause to all of them because it's not an easy time. So our job as man of the house, husband, is to try and make that time as make that time easier um, for our partners and do as much as he can. So fortunately, I guess I love cooking, so I was always in the kitchen chefing up. I've always done that from my uni days. <laughs> we ask all my friends cooking up for them after football. They'll come around my house and they'll cook up for them as well. It's just something that I love doing that I learned from my mum. Um, so I was able to do all the cooking for Anna when baby was born. Um, and I did the nights as well. So she got a lot of rest. And I think she got the most sleep than she's ever had because at the time she was a primary school teacher. Very stressful job. But yeah, able to take the night. So if you can do it, definitely jump in, help the missus. I'm sure she would appreciate it. So the next milestone will probably be when Lucas started assisted standing. So in his cot, he would pull himself up and this scared us because he knew how to get up, but he didn't really know how to get back down. We use a baby monitor, which we set up in his room. Um, It's quite good at night. It goes into like this, like night vision mode. So yeah, you can actually see him. It's really easy to see him. And so yeah, when he was in bed standing up, I'd run in and help him to get back down. It was again, as I said, it was just like a really scary time where he didn't really know how to get back down but he learned he learned quick enough how to do it so it wasn't too bad in the end at all so at this time yeah he was assisted standing he was able to roll in both directions so at first he was only like on his back could only roll into his stomach and um, but then he was able to like roll everywhere and he was crawling around as well so he's getting active now he's getting mobile again I didn't really write down any of the actual dates when these things happened so I believe this all happened around between seven and nine months like the whole do rolling in both directions standing and also crawling as well <laughs> when he did start crawling it was it was crazy just to see how quick he could get around but also when he was learning to crawl like lifting his head and he was dragging himself a little bit I was getting on my knees and I was crawling around as well and I just realized how difficult it actually is on wooden floors but when he was doing it was just rapid flying around um the floor obviously didn't seem to bother him too much so I guess like strength building and building, but for me now, stick to walking is <laughs> definitely a lot easier. But what I'm going to do at another time is do a podcast on actual feeding, how we went through weaning and um, maybe something again, I can get Anna involved in. But Luke has always been quite good at eating and food in general Um, hasn't really rejected much food. So yeah, now obviously he rejects his vegetables. If he's at home, if he's at any of the grandma's house, he's definitely eating that. There's no, there's no stress, no, no problems at all. He's just a lot more picky when he's at home with us. I guess he's learned how to wrap us around his little finger, but it is what it is. But yeah, he's always been a really good eater. But what we're going to, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to go through an actual podcast on the things that we introduced, some of our worries, our stresses, and then yeah, how we just really got him onto, like switched him off of uh, formula and breast milk onto actually eating solid food all the time. So. Yeah, moving on. First steps. Now, it was it was an amazing time. Going from crawling, doing the assisted standing to actually standing and taking a few steps. I can't again, I can't remember exactly where it was, but my memory of Luca's first steps was we actually went to Italy for a friend's wedding. <laughs> we were there for just over two weeks, stayed in um a number of different Airbnbs, uh, different hotels. And the baby has just decided to walk around. So obviously you can't baby proof hotel rooms. You can baby proof your home. Absolutely fine. So making sure the corner's all safe or putting things out of reach. But in the hotels, you just couldn't do it as well. Couldn't do it at all. And there was one place we stayed in there, um, Lake Garda, where it was marble floors. <laughs> there were glass tables and there was a cooker for some reason. He's attracted to the cooker, a cooker and just loves opening the oven door. Um, all the time he still does it now as well he's always been attracted to it uh, so yeah we couldn't really future future proof <laughs> we couldn't really baby proof any of that it just had to be watching him 100% but 
again, it was a beautiful thing to see um, getting his balance and just um, if he wants to go and if he sees something that he wants instead of like crawling, shuffling or um, asking or moaning at us to get it, um, he would actually get up, go over and just get it himself. So yeah, really just try to encourage him with his walking. Um, now, obviously he's a very strong walker, very fast as well. Quick run, as I mentioned in my previous podcast, if I'm walking with him to nursery, he's just he just shoots off. So I've got to make sure that I'm keeping fit so I can keep up with him as well. So uh, yeah, on that point about grabbing and pulling things and baby proofing. So my biggest tip or my biggest thing that I had to do was move the TV. So we had a TV on our TV stand. And for some reason, well, not for some reason, obviously the pictures were moving. Luke would run up to the TV and would love to slap the TV, slap the images if we had a TV on. And then it got to a point where I'm I'm over just slapping the TV. I actually want to pull it. So there were points when he almost pulled the actual TV down onto himself. It's not a tiny TV as well. So it would have definitely hurt him and broken the TV at the same time as well. So had to look into getting some wall brackets and putting the TV up on the wall. And by doing this quite early, we did this. So this was around when he was assisted standing. So around maybe around a seven month mark. By putting it up on the on the wall, it just completely removed his need to want to grab and touch TVs. So now even if we go around to other people's homes, I guess because he hasn't been doing it, he tends not to run up to the TV and want to pull it as well. So yeah, definitely if you can, put your TV high up, um, get some wall brackets, uh, get some of those, I don't know what they call it, but it's like it hides the wire um, from the socket up, up into the wall. I can't remember the exact name for it but it's like a little bracket thing that you stick to the wall um and it it, sh- it covers the actual cables so obviously you can't pull the pull the tv down um yeah big tip highly recommend get that tv high as possible now we're getting to around the 12 month stage and this is where we enrolled luca into nursery again this is a completely different podcast as well so we found a few local ones um went around checked them out looked at the reviews online. There's not much more you can do other than that, really. And we didn't know anyone that went to either of the nurseries that we go to at present. But the one that we picked, really like it. The workers, they're always really bubbly. Doesn't matter what time of day it is, it always got maximum energy. And Uluka's language, his singing, his, the way that he plays, all of that has developed. And it's a lot more than we probably could have done ourselves if we kept him at home. There's only so much we can teach. Um, at this point, a one-year-old, and it's just a lot better for him to be around other kids as well, developing those um, social and communication skills um, that you will need later on in life as well. So yeah, definitely, it was it was difficult, obviously, letting him go to nursery because uh, I had quite a bit of time off um, to spend with him, so in between contracts. But then also, as I said before, it was just great for him just to be around other kids, playing with them. And we've seen how much, again, we've just seen how much he's grown in this time. So now he's just singing songs. It's, it's crazy just from babbling to counting to five to singing his favourite nursery rhymes or asking for a cartoon or song that he enjoys the most. Like, And you can actually start to have those conversations with him. Obviously, he's not at a point yet where he's having full on sentences, but we understand his language and what he's trying to say. And for me, this is a dad, that's just a beautiful thing to see is that you don't really know when the things are going to happen at what point they're going to happen and what I learned very early on is not is try not to uh, base what other kids are doing on my child because again everyone develops at completely different rates so some kids might not crawl and they will just go straight to walking or some kids won't walk until the 18 months do you know what I mean so it really depends. Some kids won't talk or they won't sing until a certain age or the height. So everything, sleeping, feeding, there's so many different variations that it's really difficult to say, well, your son's doing this. Why isn't my son doing that yet? You just have to really just let them develop and grow at their own pace. And that's a skill you have to kind of learn it yourself. Definitely get a little bit better at doing it as you spend time with your child and you definitely build that bond with them. And it's something that I've learned to do as well. Just just let him let him develop at his own pace, but he seems to he seems to be doing well. But there'll be obviously other kids that do things quicker, earlier um, than he does from now. So yeah, that's it in nursery really. So 
we are raising Luca to speak uh, two languages, so English and German. He knows loads of words in both languages. He probably knows certain words in German, doesn't know them in English and vice versa as well. And just think it's a really good skill for him to have. So in the future, he has the option of where he potentially wants to live, what language he wants to speak in. Um, and it just makes, I just think it just opens the world for you, unlocks a different part of the world for you. So if you want to live in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, he can communicate there. So if it comes to getting job, get getting getting job, getting a job, working, there's obviously more opportunities for him. So yeah, just really pushing that. And obviously it's the connection to his German heritage as well. So yeah, the first 21 months, and obviously there's a lot more that's happened in between as well, but the first 21 months have been a learning journey, definitely for me. I didn't really know what to expect at becoming a dad. I didn't know how I would adapt to completely changing my personal life. So the time I was spending with my friends, time I was spending on, for example, going mountain biking or even in just playing guitar or just, again, just doing things for myself or even doing things as a couple. So myself and Anna on a Friday evening, for example, finished work long week and we fancy going out and on a whim, we could just do it. We could just jump in the car, jump on the train, go and do what you got to do. And that all completely changes when you have a child. So for some people it's difficult, but I quite like the change. <laughs> I quite like um, just being at home. And anyway, so it wasn't too difficult to make that change. But then I guess I like just spending that time with my son as well. So it, again, it's not been too much of an adaptation of not being able to go out and drink and everything. I've done all of that now. I've, we've traveled quite a bit. I've done quite a few holidays. I've like, I think I've got been to quite a few festivals. So I've got a lot of that out of my system. So now it's just more about literally getting as fit as possible, being healthy, trying to clean up my diet and just making sure that um, I'm ready <laughs> for when little man wants to go play football, run in the park. And then if we have more kids in the future as well, like my body is able to actually keep up with them because it's not easy. The bending, the picking up, playing games, constant movement, the like the, the broken sleep. Like there's a lot, it's a lot very taxing on the body, but the pros of having them around definitely outweigh all of that. So this is it's, it's a weird one. When um like when I was talking through this and I said I can't remember the, the actual months, it's probably because I, I strongly believe <laughs> when you have a child, there's a slight um element of uh traumatic stress like post-traumatic stress because you block out all of the difficult bits if you've noticed I've only ever I've only spoken about the positive things this has all just come back to me so there were nights when he wouldn't sleep at all so he's just screaming and crying no matter what we did we couldn't comfort him um he'll just be up there were times when he's been ill yeah seeing a little one when he's ill it's like it's heartbreaking there's not much you can do and obviously they can't communicate with you they can cry but they can't tell you exactly what is happening or what is wrong. So yeah, it's really difficult as a parent to just stand back and witness that. Yeah, but he's been he's been up and down with his illnesses. But all children are, especially when um, they get into nursery and they're uh, mingling with other kids. But the way I see it is it's quite important, like develop your immune system. I've got a terrible immune system. I'm really bad. I pick up colds all the time. So yeah. We wanted to get him out, just get all the diseases that he could get as early as possible. He's had horrible chest infections. He's had hand, foot and mouth. Yeah, it's that I think maybe even has asthma as well, but you can't really diagnose it when they're that little. But yeah, chest infections, colds, like nonstop back to back, a few viruses. Yeah, it gets, it gets everything. But it's, again, it's really hard just to sit back and watch that. But it's all part of the journey. You just have to kind of accept it and be there to support them. And um, just put your life on a bit of a hold while they're growing and developing. But um, yeah, that's it really for this week. The first 21 months, I guess I said, they've been really interesting. I really enjoyed them so far. I've learned loads. And I also think I've grown a lot as well and become, definitely become a lot more patient with things. Yeah, and that's about it really. So yeah, I guess the biggest thing or the biggest takeaway is just really getting on top of your time, being really efficient with your time. And Anna's really helped me be better with this by implementing a family joint calendar that we use. So if I need to be out, for example, if I need to do any filming 
or if I'm doing like a photography shoot or if I'm recording anywhere, if I'm going to studio, if I'm doing anything, put it in the calendar, meeting friends, whatever it is, put it in the calendar. Um, as long as it's in there at least a week or two weeks in advance, then we know what's happening. We can plan around it. And that's been, that's probably made everything a lot easier for us if you want to go out. So for example, if Anna's going to meet, go out and meet her friends or she's going to, she plays football a couple of times a week as well. It's all in the calendar. So we, again, it's really easy to plan what's happening on say Wednesday in two weeks time. I can look at the calendar. If it's free, I can put it in, have the conversation and it gives us time to yeah do our own things as well. Um, but then also make sure that um, Luca's uh, catered for. And that has been a big thing, I guess, that we've learned. And it's just one of the things, one of the good things about our relationship is we do appreciate that each other should have their own time to do their own things as well. And I think that's what makes us, has made us stronger. We've been together for almost, coming up to 11 years now. And just yeah, appreciating our own, appreciating each other's own time has been definitely something that's brought us a lot closer together. So yeah, something you, everyone can work on. We could do a bit better. But yeah, if you haven't got a calendar and you've got a little one coming, then get that in. It will, have, it will stop all, <laughs> all arguments, not knowing where each other are, especially if you need to, like, for example, there's a parent's evening or you need to pick up a child. If it's in there, it just makes everything a lot easier, less complicated. And yeah, arguments are not good, especially around a little one. All right, all right. So yeah, that's it for this week. If you liked what this podcast was all about, then yeah, definitely go onto my TikTok at Stop Being Busy. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if you want me to do more like this as well, not just the contracting stuff. And uh, let me let me know if you want to know more about just being a dad and all of the things that come around it and how it like affects day to day life as well. But yeah, that's it. You know, as always, we're gonna end it on this one. Stop being busy. Get out there. Go and do what you gotta do. And until next time, I'll speak to you later.